Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. Today we've got a crazy story of totally messing up a school. But first a story from Zodiac72826, claim a narrow strip of our property is your own? Fine, it's yours. Years ago when I lived at my mom's, I'd mow the yard every week. It was a hill, too steep for a riding mower, and a witch to mow with a push mower. It was rough but I usually got it done. Our next door neighbor was a jerk. He didn't like us and we didn't like him. Long story short, he was the kind of guy to call the police if me and my friends were hanging out on the porch, talking at a normal volume before 11pm, the city's noise ordinance time. Real jerk. He got his hillside terraced and the bricks he used jutted into our yard a few inches. When I mowed, I would just go straight down the hill from where the edge of his bricks were and that was the edge of one side of the yard. The terraces don't go all the way down the hill, so about halfway down I'd clear the bricks and it would be open. Well apparently one day he decided that the property line did matter and he would flat out refuse to mow a strip adjacent to our yard. The 6 inches or so that the brick terraces covered made my edge line slightly off, but my reasoning was that if he considered it part of his yard when he got the landscaping done, it was part of his yard when he wanted to mow. He disagreed and slowly a narrow strip of grass would grow. A green mohawk of pettiness dividing our yards. He was a meticulous gardener, often out on sunny days tending to his garden, keeping his grass in pristine green condition. He cared very deeply about his yard and therefore assumed that anyone else would care about their yard almost as much. But I didn't give a technicolor freak about the yard or its appearance. I literally only mowed because my mom told me to. If the decision to mow was left up to me, it would have blossomed into a Costa Rican rainforest. With music blasting in my headphones, I'd mow right next to that yard hawk every week. And it would have been absolutely no skin off my nose to move the mower over 6 inches and trim the hawk, but I didn't because that was extra work my lazy butt didn't want to do and also screw him. So at least for one solid and a half months one summer, he engaged me in a battle of wills. Sometimes literally watching me go right past the yard hawk while refusing to mow it when he did his yard. One time I caught him staring and waved. He must have assumed that I had an iron will to refuse to bow to his silent demand that I mow that 6 inch wide, 50 foot long stretch of grass when my motivations lay entirely within the realm of apathy, laziness, and pettiness. And one day, one sweet day that I'll always remember, I saw him using his full weight to body his mower over the now nearly 2 foot tall grass. The yard hawk popped up a few more times, but it never got that tall again, and I sure as heck never mowed it. Screw you, Dave. Reading this story just makes me think about all the times as a kid where I was forced to mow the yard, and man, I never enjoyed doing it. It was always the chore of chores. For anybody out there that's ever mowed a yard, or even thinking about mowing a yard where you push the mower around the whole yard, do you guys find it to be a relaxing activity or not that bad of a chore? Or do you guys despise it as much as I do? Let me know down in the comments. Our next story is from Crawdad29, Sister-in-Law Revenge. My brother-in-law proposed to my husband's sister at our very formal wedding luncheon. I didn't find out until later because my sister, my hero, told them if they didn't sit down and shut up, she'd break their teeth with a hammer. That didn't stop my husband's grandmother from being so excited for her granddaughter that she tried to make the DJ announce it and play their song so they could dance alone to it. My husband found out and shut that down immediately. Again, I had no idea. At their wedding they had a DJ and a live band. During band breaks they played music. During dinner our wedding song came on. It doesn't matter where we are, if that song comes on, we dance. So my husband pulled me up and we danced. His sister threw a six-year-old worthy temper tantrum in front of God and everyone. My husband turned, looked at her and said, Gee, what could it possibly hurt to have a special moment here? After all, you got engaged during our wedding. I was in shock. Everyone in the room went silent. She sat down and the DJ played it again, so we kept dancing. If I were OP, I would be swooning over a husband like that who's not afraid to just call out some ridiculous BS like that and put people in their place. Honestly, way braver than I would be in that moment. Even though I would be fuming about them going and getting engaged during a wedding, I don't think I'd have what it takes to, like, yell at them and call them out. 
Our next story is from AMLT1983. Charge me for return shipping on a bad item? You asked for it. About 10 years ago, I bought a used laptop off eBay. Not a great move. And though the seller said it worked, it kept crashing. The guy eventually took it back, but charged me return shipping on the broken laptop that he sent. Luckily, he made the mistake of putting his cell number on the return address label. I saved that number, and for the past 10 years, whenever I was up at a weird hour for whatever reason, I blocked my number and called him at like 3am and woke him up. Early flight? Call. Can't sleep? Call. Out late with friends? Call. I'd call until he answered. Sadly, he never refunded my $24, but I sure as heck got $24 worth from him. This is undisputedly fully enacted revenge. But I think it goes without saying that OP went a little overboard on this $24. I would be pissed off too, but I don't know if I would do that for 10 years. In fact, if anything, OP being hung up on it that bad for 10 years probably cost OP way more than $24 in time and effort. I think that just goes without saying. Our next story is from Wild Witch 306 Want to make my job harder so you can dip out of work early? Fine, I'll show you. Thanks to COVID, I've had to shutter my small business and have taken a job as a server at a well-known southern and country cuisine chain restaurant. It's fine, I really like my co-workers. All except one. We'll call him Ben. Ben is a jerk. He's basically decided his entire personality is just going to be witchy. He's also lazy. He's always trying to leave early. Like the other night. The other night I was scheduled off at 9 and Ben was supposed to be off at 9.30. Instead, he decided he wanted to cut out early per the usual. He starts refusing tables at 8.45 and instead putting them in my section, knowing full well I was scheduled off before he was, so I was irritated. I'm about to find management when I realize he's already left. On top of that, he broke down the soda machines on our side of the server's galley, and he'd put the spigots into the chemical soak, which wouldn't have been an issue, except that particular machine is the only one that has certain sodas, like Cherry Coke and Coke Zero. And it just so happened that some of the tables he fobbed off on me was drinking both, so now I'm irate. The thing about a broken down soda machine is that it still works, but without a spigot it makes a really big mess. So you better believe I used the heck out of it, leaving soda residue everywhere. About this time the manager comes around and notices the mess. He goes to see who has the soda machine for side work, and notices lo and behold, it's Ben. And Ben is already gone, before he's scheduled to, while yours truly is still there. I'm an honest person, so I admitted I had made the mess, but explained about Ben leaving early and my table still drinking soda from that machine. You're supposed to leave the two Coke, Zero, and Cherry spigots on until close, so everything together made the manager irate. He told me not to clean it up, that Ben opened the next morning, and he, in fact, would clean it up. By the next morning, the machine was a gunky, sticky mess that took him over an hour to clean. An hour he wasn't allowed to have tables. So screw you, Ben. Hope you had fun. I think the urge to just lie and say Ben made that mess in that situation, it would be so easy to just make Ben the complete fall guy there. So honestly, I have a lot of respect for OP for just being honest and saying, hey, he totally dropped the ball on me, left early, and while I did make this mess, it was because of Ben. I just don't understand how Ben can leave early like that willy-nilly and somehow still have a job in the morning. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every video has great stories like our next one from I Like Oranges lol. My dad returned a stink bomb to our neighbor. My dad had an annoying neighbor experience a while back and I wanted to share. I don't know how it started or who found it first, but someone found a diaper in our backyard once and no one knew where it came from. It took my dad setting up a camera in the backyard to find out that our neighbor from behind our house was tossing used diapers into our backyard. And it wasn't just one time. My dad asked them to stop, but of course they kept going. One day, my dad found another diaper that had been thrown over our fence, and this one was completely full. My dad was sick of the whole thing, so he chucked it right back over the fence towards the neighbor's house. 
the whole thing exploded as it hit the car window. Needless to say, no more diapers were found in our backyard. Do you guys think if your neighbor is the kind of parent that would lob a filled diaper into your yard, that it would be worth sending a call into CPS to report some potentially troublesome behavior? Does the act of those parents throwing those diapers over the fence maybe constitute that they're just not good parents in general, like they might be doing other not-so-great things? Let me know what you guys think. This next story is from Combination C1629. I messed with the wrong mark. Back in the 1980s at McDonald's restaurants, the plastic trays had paper job applications as a liner for the tray when your food was served to you. Well, my buddies Pete, Mark, and I were killing time before our movie in the town we lived in, and the McDonald's was a couple blocks down from the little movie fourplex. Mark went to use the restroom after his hot lava apple pie. Seriously, they used to be served at molten lead temperature. And Pete and I decided to play a prank on Mark and fill out the job application for Mark and turn it in. Back then, everyone had their phone number and address in the local phone book, so we quickly looked up Mark's parents in the white pages, filled out the application, and gave the application to the shift manager. Pete and I promptly forgot the joke we pulled as soon as we left because we were 14-year-olds. Now, Mark's parents were pretty healthy eaters, so when the hiring manager called Mark's house while we were at the movie to see if he could start training the next week for his new career in the fast food industry, they were a little miffed. Mark didn't say a word to us about getting in trouble. However, we actually heard about it from Mark's older brother, Gary. Gary told us good job on the joke, and we again forgot about everything. Here's the petty and hilarious revenge. Looking up addresses in the white pages goes both ways. A few weeks later, my mom comes inside from getting the mail, and she asks if we needed to talk. I'm sure I stared at her with a blank look like a golden retriever. She shows me the informational brochure addressed to me from Bedwetters Anonymous. Pete got signed up for the same thing, so we knew who we should thank for our awkward parental conversations. You win, Mark. All things considered, there probably could have been some worse things than Bedwetters Anonymous. All in all, though, I can imagine it's pretty embarrassing for your parents to walk in letter in hand and be like, so should we be concerned and hand you that letter and you see Bedwetters Anonymous on it? Let's be real though, Bedwetters Anonymous is really selling out their clientele if they're going to put Bedwetters Anonymous on the letter. I feel like if that's an actual service, which it might be just a prank service, but if it's real, they're not really doing a whole lot of good by you if they have Bedwetters Anonymous on the letter blatantly. Our next story is from Seapor CV, an engineer's revenge. I worked as a mechanical design engineer for a small family owned company that manufactured beverage dispensing equipment. The owner of this business, let's call him Bill, was an arrogant man that ruled with an iron fist. He insisted on being involved in every stage of the new product development cycle, from ideation to alpha and beta testing. At the time, I was designing a machine that would upgrade current output by 200%. Think a soda fountain with two times the speed. This machine was going to be Big Boss Bill's cash cow for the next fiscal year, so naturally, he was very interested in it. He was projecting several million dollars in sales. It was in the initial build stage, a bunch of pumps, wires, and motors held together by unfinished steel brackets and zip ties, far from the final release look. He would often show up to my workstation with no PPE, asking questions like, Is this done yet? Did you fix the hydraulic system leaks? Why did you choose the most expensive valve for this design, etc.? For those that don't know, being an engineer today is not like how it was in the 30s and 40s. Many think that we're like Howard Hughes going to fancy parties and inventing cool gadgets and swimming in money. Far from that. We get a PC and an assembly station to build our prototypes, getting our hands dirty like the rest of them, all while making just a little bit more than the average college grad. We need our space to ourselves to do our job. Having somebody mess with your tools and projects hinders our work and creates obstacles in progress. If this someone happens to be the nosy owner of the company, your job gets 10 times more stressful. Big Boss Bill would come look at my unfinished project every Friday while I was away at lunch and play with wires, move tubes, abort test runs, and critique every aspect of it. 
He would send feedback through my boss telling him the components I selected were too expensive and that the soda mix was too watery. The alpha prototype was more than a year away and he was complaining that things weren't done yet? That's like telling the baker the cake tastes funny after tasting the uncooked dough. Bill was unbelievable. The last straw was when Bill inadvertently reprogrammed the dispensing settings while my prototype was on a 72 hour simulation test run. I talked to my boss, three levels below Big Bill, to please tell him to stop interfering with my work. But everyone knew it was Bill's company and he owned everything in it. His dad left him in charge and he could do as he pleased with everyone's work. I had enough of Bill playing with my work and delaying it. One Friday I decided to set up my machine a little differently. Knowing he was going to fiddle around, I punched up the juice in the pressure regulator, loaded a sour mix of coffee and soda in the cartridge, and reprogrammed the user interface with a big shiny button that read, slow serve 12 ounce. I rerouted the dispensing tubes to point directly at the person standing in front of the prototype. If that wasn't enough, I installed a diffusing nozzle to it so it can spray him for maximum carnage. You wouldn't go touching an open breaker panel while the electrician works on it. Why would you go fiddling with a partial commercial product build? I wanted to teach him a lesson. I covered it with cowls so it wasn't so obvious. I took that Friday off because I didn't want to stick around for the imminent crap show. And a crap show it was. I got a call at about 12.23 from work asking if I can come in. My coworkers told me that Bill, who's normally soft-spoken and observant, was covered in Pepsi and cussing like a sailor. From the description of the lab tech who witnessed the madness, he said the whole lab was covered in black syrupy stuff and smelled like burnt motors. Bill pressed the slow serve 12 ounce immediately and was peppered from head to toe in the stuff. But it gets worse, he wasn't alone. He had a tour of three potential buyers for this machine next to him who also got spunked. I set the output pressure so high that the dispensing nozzle became unhinged and violently spun around causing some monetary damage to the lab and its inhabitants. I didn't want this to happen. My pettiness went too far. No, I wasn't fired, but I was assigned a lengthy project to improve workplace safety and procedures. The man had the nerve to say that I needed to take extra precautions to prevent unsafe builds from being operated by unauthorized persons. Bill never fiddled with my work again. I feel like this is the high level human equivalent of putting tin foil all over the kitchen counter so when the cat jumps up on the counter, the sound scares them and they slowly learn not to mess with it. In this case, you just basically try to drown them in Pepsi and although it went a little off the rails, I think job well done. Our next story is from Tater314, Revenge on I-75. I finally got some revenge. I work as a transport for funeral homes, so I do a lot of driving. If you know anything about Atlanta, then you know that the interstate is basically a lawless free-for-all zone. Just kidding, but seriously. There was a lot of traffic yesterday, and the interstate was at a dead stop. I was attempting to merge onto the road from the exit ramp, and I got to the very end and sat there for a minute or two with my blinker on. Finally, a little space opened up behind a truck, and I was about to take it when a car full of old people sped up to make sure I couldn't get in. Wow, okay jerks, now it's on. As soon as the truck moved forward, enough room for me to fit my front tires into the spot opened up, and I took it. I immediately turn around and give the driver a cheeky smile and wave, and I can see that she's pretty upset with me. I straighten my car out, and she gets to about an inch from my rear bumper. Gotcha, witch. They were so close now that there was no way they could move into another lane without rear-ending me. I put my car in a park and proceed to let every other car merge into traffic. For five minutes we sat there. I just ate my french fries while the car behind me cursed up a storm, flailing their arms in anger. Everyone else just went around us. I'm not gonna lie, I love hearing these stories of revenge, especially the ones that work out super well, but I think about myself driving in traffic and I think about some of the videos I've seen out there of people with road rage, and honestly the kind of climate we live in nowadays as far as America goes, and I'm of the opinion that even if somebody is like irate at me, I'm just gonna try to get out of their way. If I have to move into the right lane and slow down real hard and just let them go away, I think I'm all about just de-escalating when it comes to any kind of angry driving, road rage, any of that stuff. 
Honestly, I feel like it's just not worth it. Our next story is from Baffled and Willing, Rained on Manager's Parade. This was my second job after leaving high school. I went to work for a grocery store that was down the street from my house. I was hired on as a cashier, given my work experience, and things were going pretty well. I started to get bored of being a cashier and started assisting with stocking shelves so that I could get out of cashiering when it was busy. They noticed that I was able to excel in this role as I was able to stock inventory pretty quickly and also assist with bagging groceries and gathering carts from outside. Fast forward a year, I was still in the same position, learning the ins and outs of the stock room and more efficient methods of unloading and loading product. Now, there was this manager, we'll call him Steve. I'd been asking Steve for about six months to help obtain my forklift certification so that I may operate the forklift when there aren't any operators around. He kept putting it off as he was too busy to help certify me. His being busy consisted of multiple smoke breaks and complaining to the owner that we need to let go some people for being too slow and lazy. I was not a fan when I had overheard it as I was gathering more stock from the back to stock the shelves. A few months pass and we do lose some people, unfortunately. It definitely made work harder as there was more to get done, but not enough people to do it. Now the manager Steve, of course, was nowhere to be seen to help out. So the other co-workers and myself had to get things done. The only time we would see Steve is when he's gloating to the manager about all of this work he's been doing, and that's why the store looks so great and stocked. Man, this would piss us off. Now Steve had a vacation coming up. He was going out of town to see some friends he hadn't seen in a while. But what he failed to remember was, we had shipments every Friday come to the store that we had to unload off of the truck, and Steve was going to be gone for two weeks. Why is this a problem? Because Steve was the only certified forklift operator at the store, so we had to turn away shipments of product because our operator was there and he refused to certify anyone else. The drivers weren't able to operate the forklift either because they weren't insured or something along those lines. I don't quite remember as it was so long ago. The owner comes in one day asking why the shelves are so bare. I advise that Steve is the only forklift operator at the store and that I've been trying to get him to certify me, but he refuses to. So the owner calls up Steve, yelling and screaming at him. She was suspending him for two weeks without pay. Steve didn't like the sound of this, so he starts calling the owner names and then quits out of nowhere. I was dumbfounded. He couldn't just accept fault and move on. So the owner hangs up, apologizes to me for the swearing then immediately got someone on the phone to come into the store to not only assist with unloading deliveries on Fridays, but to also certify me on the forklift, and I got a promotion. It was glorious. I've got to be honest with you, I don't have much sympathy for people who act like this. I know somebody who was away on a trip that was living in a shared living space with another couple people, and the other people who were living there were watching over their stuff and their pets. When they got back from the trip, I guess their pets were a little chunkier than before, and they went off on the people saying they did a terrible job and they're going to have to take over the feeding regimen again, just like really laying into these people. In return, those people say to them to their face they don't appreciate being talked to like that and how they were watching over everything for free. And because the person who got back from the trip can never accept fault, cannot ever work with anybody... They were self-destructive and they went and left the living situation that was really good for them because they were unable to apologize or admit fault. This story where they just could not apologize or work with anybody and would rather just quit than just try to work with people made me think of exactly that story. And our final story of the day is from Jonah the Villain, Artist Frames a Bully for Vandalism featuring Freddy Fazbear. I was born autistic, and while most people with low support needs don't really get a gift, like in The Good Doctor or Rain Man or anything, I actually did. It's nothing brainy or whatever though. I've been drawing since I was a baby, and while I'm no renaissance painter or anything, my skill level went pretty far above other kids my age. Most of my kindergarten drawings looked like a 4th or 5th grader made them, and I kept up the grind as the years passed. My classes usually had bad teachers, and most of my peers struggled a lot, especially with English. I was the only one who was good at it. I read a lot of books, especially graphic novels. I finished schoolwork quickly and had a lot of free time on my hands. And to appease the demons teaching us, I'd low-key offer to do assignments for other kids, as long as they could show me a sample of their handwriting. I actually got bullied a lot, 
and this plus being known as the art kid, who usually drew fan art of whatever book we were reading in class to make it more interesting, was a way to get kids off my back for a while. I do their homework, the teacher stops yelling at everyone for doing it wrong, we move on, and the kids cut me some slack for a while, everybody wins. But unfortunately, one of my bullies had family issues and a stutter. And starting in 6th grade, the way he would handle it is by targeting me for my disability. Enter Jack. Jack was always causing trouble during lunch and after dismissal. He would draw hot dogs in the social studies textbook sometimes. He'd pantsed other boys, made sexual comments and insults all the time to both girls and guys, especially me, and mocked all my autistic traits. I can't eat everything other kids can eat? Jack makes fun of me for it. I'm not as coordinated as other kids during recess? Jack makes fun of me for it. I show interest in another student? Jack gets the entire class to harass me over it, sticks a pencil in and out of a pencil sharpener and tells everyone, look it's Jonah and so and so after dark. And god forbid I still indulged my Nintendo obsession in 6th grade, I've genuinely gotten some of my Mario merch, like lunchboxes, destroyed just for bringing it to school while being too old. Keep in mind we were 10 or 11. Not only that, but sometimes he'd rip up my drawings too, or leave his own rude ones in my doodle notebook. Jack and I got into multiple physical fights when no teachers were around, and even that never permanently fixed the problem. Neither did telling. The last straw though was when the assistant principal gave me a copy of the Hunger Games book near the end of the year. I read the book in three sittings and I loved it. I even tried to draw Katniss, but I made the mistake of reading it during lunch and leaving it on the table with about half the class to go grab food real quick. For whatever reason, I don't open the book again until I get home, and when I do, the entire inside of the cover is scribbled on with wieners, and there's boogers on some pages. I was livid. 11 year old me was like, who the freak does this to books? Darn it, I know the teachers aren't gonna do anything either. I went to angrily listen to the living tombstone as usual and start off homework. I opened the social studies textbook I took home from school that day, and what do I see but another Richard drawn by Jack. I remember that he got in trouble for these a while back, and then suddenly I had an idea. I swear to God, the Grinch smile just slid onto my face. Jack was one of the boys I'd done homework from before, and I knew what he drew like thanks to him messing with my notebooks. I get right to work imitating his doodle dongs all over the inside of the cover where you sign your name. I put a few on the pages. I made sure to use my left hand, just like when I'd done work for him before, because he was known to write pretty messily. I wrote things like, my Richard is huge and Jack was here and drew mustaches and dongs on historical figures. The textbooks had a special spot in the bookcases and desks for our classroom but there were way more books than there were kids. They weren't assigned either, everybody just grabbed a random one from the shelf. You would never notice if one was missing, so not only did I bring this one back like nothing happened and slid it into its spot, I began smuggling other social studies textbooks out of the classroom and to my house to do the same thing all over again, rinse and repeat for about a week. I think the best part was when I drew Freddy Fazbear and took up the entire inside of the cover with one of them. This was June 2015 and back then, everyone watched Markiplier and was waiting for Five Nights at Freddy's 4. I remember sketching it out super lightly in pencil, all nervous because I was doing my best to make it look like he drew it and not me. He drew people kind of like they were in Roblox. And Freddy's bipedal like a human, so I made a tall, kind of Roblox proportioned, lopsided Freddy Fazbear, just sketched lightly in pencil, semi erased, and then inked in huge wobbly sharpie lines, staring into your soul. I was so proud I started laughing. I wish I had a phone back then to take a picture because that Freddy looked hilarious. Not only that though, but it was from a horror game super inappropriate to be drawn in school, our teacher was gonna flip. And oh, flip she did. That Friday, I faked sick to get out of school and escape Jack's bullying. He and I had had a really serious incident in recess a few days prior. And the following Monday, I came back and he was gone. Gone from the bus and everything. 
Apparently on Friday, our teacher had us open the books, and wouldn't you know it, several kids had grabbed and opened vandalized ones and she noticed, including the one with Freddy. Jack got into major trouble for defacing so much school property, it was clearly his handwriting, and he got straight up suspended for the rest of the year. And I knew his grandma was his guardian due to previous bullying incidents. She was the only adult who would actually do something about him picking on me and chew him out at home. She would have definitely have been ready to tear him a new one for vandalism. My teacher was still gathering up information from other kids. A few had already seen him actually doodle in the books before and told her as such, which made him look guilty as freak, and then she finally got a chance to ask me about it. Her little innocent class golden boy. She went, Jonah, have you got a moment? See me in the hallway. Me, a well-behaved, short, and adorable little fella with big nerdy glasses and messy hair, said, Yes, ma'am. She said, Have you noticed any drawings in any of the textbooks? I say, "Uh Uh-huh. She says, What kind of drawings did you see? I say, Um, there were a lot of private parts. They say, Okay, a private part. Yes. Do you by any chance know? I say, Oh, and I saw a robo-bear and another one. She says, Right. Do you know who was making these? This is vandalism and it can actually be considered a crime. I say, "Uh uh-huh. I already know it's Jack. He draws weird stuff on my stuff too. Can I show you my doodle book? Look, it matches. I ended up showing her my notebook. I'd stopped bringing Hunger Games with me to school because Jack kept smacking it out of my hands in the hall. And amongst all the crayon drawings of Magalore and Zero Two from Kirby, Dupless from The Thousand Year Door, etc., she saw some more rude doodles that didn't seem to be mine. She seemed pretty mad, but not surprised. I don't remember the entire fallout, but I heard from other kids that Jack had to face the Board of Ed about this, since it was multiple books and really, really bad. Apparently, he kept crying to his grandma that he didn't do anything. I stood right quiet, but smiled to myself throughout the last two weeks of school. He ended up moving to Florida shortly after too, so I basically got rid of him for good. Moral of the story, you're going to vandalize another student's property, maybe don't pick a good artist who has experience copying others' handwriting. Oh, and drawing bad Freddies is hilarious. I just kinda love that this is a whole story about how OP learned how Jack drew Richards in textbooks. You know, study the technique with which Jack drew these big, long, you know what's, and masterfully recreated them himself. And also Freddy Fazbear. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another revenge story that was way crazier than any of the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, click on the right. That said though, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.